Welcome to William Tells, an insightful look inside the private music studio. This program is brought to you from Pedal Point Music in Atlanta, Georgia. Well, hello, my friend. Welcome. Grab a notepad for today's topic. I'm going to venture into an overview of studying music as a vocalist. There are so many things to cover in studying voice, but there are some basics that instructors tend to agree on and try to ingrain within the musical psyche of all their singers. Our podcast is not long enough today to cover everything in one episode, so you can be certain I'll visit this subject again. For today, though, let's swoop in, as it were, and cover the basics. Today on William Tells, The Owl Says Who. I've taught voice to a number of students over the years of all different ages. For the most part, the last few years seem to have been focused on young singers. In fact, many of them are 10 years old or younger. Some instructors believe that it's a mistake to teach children younger than 10 years old because their lungs aren't quite developed. Well, I guess that could be argued, but I've observed that children are going to sing, compete, perform from a very early age. And if they're doing that, they should be aware of good vocal technique and good vocal habits, even at an early age. The earlier a singer understands how to stay vocally healthy and sing correctly, the better the chances of enjoying that talent for many years to come. I have one other thing to say about this subject, and I always say this to my voice student the first time they're with me. Your voice is your instrument. It's not a piano. It's not an accordion. <laughs> it's, it's not a guitar. It's not a clarinet that you can throw in the closet if you get tired of it or sell on eBay and forget about it. Your voice is unique. It's yours, and it's always there. And every time you speak, you will remember singing because it comes from your voice there. And so when you start, fall in love with your voice. It's yours. There's no one in the world that has a voice like yours. Make the most of it. And don't be afraid to make mistakes. But also remember that it's attached to you. So emotionally, be prepared for some disappointments along the way. But overall, I think you'll enjoy your studies vocally. Let's get started. Where does music begin? Where does singing begin? When I ask that question in the first session of a vocal lesson, I'm standing up at a dry erase board drawing a big head of something that looks like an alien from another planet. And you know what? People look at it and they're like, what is going on here? But you know, before you begin that note, your brain signals your body to produce the sound we know as singing. Music is an art of sound. The mind is the first to conceive the sound that you will share as a song. Arguably, music originates with an experience, a belief, or an emotion. Yet, to communicate that feeling or experience, the mind has to give the body proper signals to begin to produce the sounds we call singing. Here are some of the basic physical aspects that go into singing. Number one, your lungs. The voice requires an energy source to operate. That energy source is rather abundant, and it's all around you. It's air. That's right. So the mind signals the lungs to fill with air. That's your energy source. The next part of your anatomy that's so important is the larynx. 
Your vocal bands are located in your larynx. Some people refer to this as your voice box. It's inside your neck, at the top of your lungs, set up there. Air passes over your larynx or over your vocal bands, on its way into and out of the lungs. The brain signals the vocal bands to tighten or loosen to a precise length, which will greatly contribute to the accuracy of your notes. As the air passes over the vocal bands, it creates a buzzing sound. It's very similar to a kazoo. This brings in another part of your anatomy, your head and your face. Inside your head is your skull, and there are cavities in there called sinuses. These are your resonators. The buzzing sound from the larynx travels upward into those sinus cavities and the mask of your face. And the sound that results is called tone. The beauty of singing is found in the way that we produce this tone. We will have quite a few sessions on tone in the future, but for now, let's just note that sounds of tone are seated in the vowel sounds, A, E, I, O, U, and sometimes Y. Now, with those vowels and with that tone, you have to have articulators, right? The percussion section is important. Your lips, tongue, and teeth help you form words and phrases. Those are your articulators, your rhythm section, and they help us produce syllables and words. There's so much more to learn about this and the anatomy to singing, but for now, those are the basic parts. It's already easy to see how important good health is to beautiful singing, right? Because those are the areas where we get colds and allergies and sinus infections. So you want to make sure that you're in good uh, lung health and sinus health and all the health that goes into uh, keeping all that resonation alive and well. Regular exercise and taking care of your health are first steps toward being a good singer. Stand up. Posture. Posture is our next big thing to look at here in singing. It's one of the most important elements, actually, because it puts you in a position to do everything else you need to do. Good posture allows the body to support the voice from all of the physical angles necessary for good singing. A young student, unless physically incapable of doing so, should always stand throughout their vocal lesson at home during their practice, and of course in their performances. Let's look at why. What makes good posture and why is it important to good singing? Number one, stand up straight with your eyes level, looking straight ahead. That's the first step in good posture. This frees the tonal and percussive mechanisms of the mask and mouth to function at their best. It also allows for a better intake of air and that is a singer's energy source. Number two, your shoulders should be comfortably lowered with your hands at your side. Slumped or raised shoulders inhibit good lung production. Number three, your rib cage should remain steady and raised. Keeping the rib cage raised really means keeping it level and making room for the lungs to expand as they fill with air. Be careful not to pump those shoulders up and down while you're taking in your air. This can lead to hyperventilation. Your knees should always be comfortably loose, allowing for good circulation. Locking your knees often results in poor circulation, which could lead to fainting. Hyperventilation is when the lungs get confused in the rhythm of the breathing. You get in trouble. It's happened to the best of us, I think. Not that I'm all that great, but I remember hyperventilating a couple of times when I was in college and trying to get the idea of how to fill my lungs with air and dole that air out. Well, locking your knees can have a terrible effect, too. We've seen the videos of people collapsing and falling during a choir concert. 
and it's probably because they locked their knees and interfered with the circulation of the blood through their system. So don't lock your knees. Keep them comfortably loose. Final thing, your feet should be set comfortably apart, allowing for balance and control. Some people find that having one foot back and turned slightly away from the other gives better balance and control. And balance is essential to good focus as you energize your body for singing. You'll discover much about the energy your body is capable of utilizing for singing once you make good posture second nature to your vocal approach. Stand up and be heard. Okay, the final thing I want to talk about today is aloft singing, not aloof singing. We have enough aloof singers. I don't need any more, do we? <laughs> Hopefully you're not an aloof singer, uh, but an aloft singer. Now, in my studio, uh, I make my vocalist owls, and I have a reason for doing that. It has to do with tonality. And uh, another discussion, and it's alluded to in what I'm about to say here, but another discussion for a whole episode probably is about lift, and lifting the soft palate so that your vowel sounds uh, are even and open and beautiful. But lifting that soft palate uh, occurs naturally with the vowel sound ooh if you do it like an owl, like whoo. Whew. And if you do that, you can actually feel uh, that soft palate in the back of your throat lift. It's the yawning sensation. You know, when you yawn, you feel the back of your throat lift up. That's your soft palate stretching back there. And you want that lifted while you're singing. So here are uh, some things, and I've already kind of delved into one of the points. Let me back up and do this acronym, ALOFT, A-L-O-F-T. Tone is the appealing element in good singing. The Italians have a term for it, bel canto, which they use to describe a beautiful singer. There are varying opinions on the origin of bel canto and its true meaning, but it's certainly been used to describe beautiful tone, an open, resonant, bell-like tone. A singer's approach to tone should be at the core of his or her vocalizing process. I like to refer to this as a loft tonality. So here it is. A. Alluring. While you want to think of your tone as beautiful, everyone's voice is unique. Alluring is different from beautiful. It speaks more to an appeal based on uniqueness rather than the beauty. It's magnetic, and it's interesting. L, lifted. This is a reference to your vocal anatomy. At the back of your mouth, and I've already said this, is an area called the soft palate. This area lifts and stretches when you yawn. Lifting the soft palate is essential to good vowel placement, as well as maintaining a healthy voice. O, open. You will not be heard until you open up. Imagine someone standing outside of a closed door speaking to you. Perhaps some of the sound would carry, albeit muffled, through the closed door. Open that door, though, and suddenly there's clarity, as you are now able to hear without the barrier of the door. Opening your mouth while singing does the same thing. It allows the beautiful tone you've generated to be heard. So open. F. Free. Free. Your neck houses your larynx. Make certain that you keep this area relaxed, tensing the neck muscles or attempting to manipulate the vocal bands by squeezing them can lead to nodules and other undesirable physical issues. Allow this area to do what it does naturally while focusing on lift and openness. And finally, T. Tone. The resulting sound of lifting, opening, and freeing the voice is beautiful tone. Of all of the elements that go into singing, tone is the element that is unique to each 
singer. Soaring to new heights vocally begins with good tonality. Time spent developing a luring tone is time well spent. <laughs> Well, this is just the beginning. Singing is hard work. There are many other aspects to be covered. So why not do yourself a favor today and do your research? Find a private instructor and begin studying voice. A good instructor can guide you toward the tonality and vocal production that you desire while helping you develop healthy habits toward vocal sustenance and longevity. And longevity is a big part of it. Things can happen in life, and we've all heard beautiful voices that as that person aged, some traumatic event happened and they lost their ability to produce that sound. But take advantage of taking care of your voice now while you're young and enjoy it for as long as you can. It's a wonderful, wonderful gift and a wonderful opportunity we have to sing. Well, that's all for today's episode. I'm so happy you were here for this. Tell your friends and family to listen. In fact, subscribe to our podcast and never miss an episode. Do you have some input after hearing today's topic you want to share with me? Drop me a line. I'd love to hear from you. Send it to williamtells at pedalpointmusic.com. Until next time, remember that music is the constant voice beneath the progressions of life. William Tells is a production of Paddle Point Music in Atlanta, Georgia. 